Good evening, and welcome to another Beyond the Walls public lecture series. These events are organized by the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech in collaborations with Oshawa Public Libraries. My name is Jennifer Gardner, and I am the Manager of Community Engagement and Programs at Oshawa Public Libraries. And together with my colleagues, Andrea Braithwaite, Jennifer Clark, and Karen Douglas, it is my pleasure to welcome you. The land we are standing on today is a traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Oshawa is covered under the Williams Treaties and as a settler on these lands, we are all treaty people. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding of the Indigenous stewards of these ancestral lands and ensure that the voices of the First Peoples are represented in our collections, programs, and services. We encourage everyone with us tonight to become aware of the treaty relationships and traditional territories you're situated in, wherever you may be located. A bit on netiquette, please keep your mics muted during the presentation. And if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or type the letter Q in the chat and we'll open up your mic during the discussion period. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available in a few days on both the faculty and the library's websites. Oh, and on YouTube. There will be a link to a short survey added in the chat and we encourage you to fill it out and provide us with any feedback on tonight's discussion or any of the past Beyond the Walls lectures, or maybe some future ideas you'd like to see. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. Now I will turn it over to Andrea for our guest's introduction. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, this evening, I am really excited to introduce to everyone, Chelsea Lalonde the Social Science, Humanities and Education Librarian here at Ontario Tech. As masters of information science, librarians play an integral role in our research community, schooling not just our students, but also our faculty members in how to find, use and keep on top of the wealth of research information generated in the social sciences and humanities worldwide. Chelsea's own expertise in information management, circulation and retrieval make her a crucial part of the work we do here. And I am totally ready to take notes this evening as she guides us through the slippery status of copyrighted images in the digital age. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm Chelsea and I'm the Social Science, Humanities and Education Librarian at the Ontario Tech Library. And my talk tonight is called Picture This, Image Reuse and Sleuthing. So how it started, how I got into this is that as a librarian, I answer copyright and licensing questions at the library. And I often get questions from students, instructors, faculty um, and staff about image reuse. So I started using reverse image searching to locate original sources. When I was asked um, about if uh, the images were, if reuse was allowed for certain um, things, right? Um, and this allowed me to find the original source of the image and figure out what the terms of use were and kind of pass it on to people. So now I use reverse image searching um, still to answer kind of copyright questions and give people an idea if they can reuse the images. But I also um, kind of use the skills to like reverse image search to identify objects that I'm interested in, um, sometimes to find similar objects if there's something that I see and I'm interested in finding something similar or to get like pricing or value information about an item. So I'm going to start by talking about reusing images and the importance of kind of knowing the terms of use and finding images that are reusable for um, the reuse that you want or the work that you want to create, for example. So 
we include images to illustrate ideas and concepts in work we create. And we share our own images sometimes in that work. And we also share other people's images. Um, we might reuse images in things like maybe an article that we write, maybe in course material or assignments that we complete. Um, sometimes presentations like the one I have tonight, I've got images throughout. Um, if we create a video, we want to make sure that the images we're included in there reusing are allowable for the, that use under copyright um, and the terms and conditions of the images. And we also share um, images a lot through social media. So the images we create, so pictures we take or images we create are our intellectual property, which means that the copyright belongs to us. And we can choose how we want other people to reuse our images. Um, we can do this as the copyright holder on our image by applying a license that specifies the terms for use. And we can kind of choose the license that we want to apply to these works. And in the same way, other people's works also have terms and conditions applied to them by the copyright owner, which is often the creator. And those terms will tell us how we can reuse those images. And that's really important because we want to avoid um, infringing on other people's copyright and making sure that the works that we create are um, reusing resources in a good way and accurately. So when we're reusing images, we always want to check that the image that we found is allowable, the reuse is allowable. And we want to look at the terms of use just to verify um, that we can reuse that source. Where do you find information about the terms of use? Um, oftentimes when we find images online, there might be a credit or an attribution below the image, and that might give us details about how the image can be reused. So for example, in this image, uh, mountains, I can see in the attribution that it's a Creative Commons image, so right away, in the attribution, I know how it can be reused. If I follow that uh, Creative Commons license, it'll give me the specifics of the term. Sometimes you won't have an attribution under an image. So you really don't know if that image, you know, belongs to that website or was used with permission or whatnot. So where could you find information about reusing content from that website? Um, well, you can find it sometimes in a legal section on a website. Sometimes there'll be a terms of use section on a website. There could be a copyright section or a license section as well. And usually in that section, it will tell you how you can reuse works that are found on that website, maybe tell you um, certain conditions where you can reuse it or what kind of attribution they would like. It's always important to credit the source of the image um, as specified by the source. So a lot of sources will have specifics about how they want the attribution to be credited. So with this image of the mountains, this was the specific attribution that the Creative Commons license suggested. So in this case, it was just a matter of kind of copying and pasting it because Creative Commons licenses are often provided for you and pretty straightforward to figure out the attribution. So next I'm gonna talk about where we can find images that you can reuse. So finding images you can reuse. So I was mentioned, as I mentioned, you want to check the copyright licensing in terms of use for each source to make sure that there's no restrictions that might apply and that the reuse is going to be allowable for whatever project you're using the image for. So some common types of examples of licenses that allow reuse are Creative Commons licenses, open licenses, or public domain. So when we talk about Creative Commons, this is a type of license that can be applied to a work or an image. Um, and it allows reuse based on certain conditions. So there could be conditions like non-commercial uses. So you could reuse the image just not for commercial uses. There's some um, restrictions that allow no derivatives or want you to share alike. These Creative Commons image or licenses are pretty clear. Um, they'll explain very clearly the reuse and what's allowable or not. So they're very nice and easy to follow and they do require attribution the attribution is very clearly set out so you can kind of figure it out if you're putting it in um, kind of like on an assignment or web page you put the attribution beneath sometimes in a video you can use it on the slide or you can put it at the end sometimes it's the same with the presentation as well um, open licensed images or works um, can be used a little bit more freely than Creative Commons in that sometimes attribution isn't necessary. 
Um, and you just want to make sure you look at the terms of use of the license and make sure that um, your reuse is allowable. And usually it's pretty clearly outlined for you. So openly licensed um, images are a really good resource um, because the creator has basically waived their rights or uh, put their image in a repository that's openly licensed, which allows you to reuse it. And another uh, type of image or work you could reuse is a public domain work. And public domain is a term that describes um, when a work's license has expired or the copyright has expired. And this is usually 70 years after the creator's death in Canada. Um, and works that have expired from copyright would be in the public domain. Um, some creators may specifically license their work as CC0 or put it specifically in the public domain. And in that case, you could also use it, but generally copyright will apply. So reusing Creative Commons images. This is an example of a Creative Commons image. Um, and two places that I often go to find Creative Commons images are Wikimedia Commons and CC Search. And when you find a Creative Commons image in a Creative Commons repository, there'll be information about why, how you can reuse it. Um, for this specific example, this is a CCBY 2.0 license. So you can click on the license and it'll say exactly how you can use it, the specific terms and conditions. It also gives me a statement for attribution, which I could just simply copy and paste beneath the image. So you can see that I've provided my attribution for this image here. And so that's a good way to reuse an image. You can also reuse images with open licenses. And I do this a lot as well. Um, some image databases have open licenses where the terms and conditions of reuse are more open. So you can reuse for more, um, more to reuse and uh, mix up the work a different way. So I often use Unsplash or Pexels. And we can see in the license that it allows the images to be downloaded for free. Um, commercial and non-commercial purposes are allowable and no permissions needed. Um, attribution is appreciated, but not required. So you could reuse the image without having attribution, which sometimes is nice if you're creating a video and you just want something in the background, um, but you want to make sure that the terms and conditions allow you not to have an attribution. Um, we can see that the terms for pixels are pretty much the same. And we can see with Unsplash that they also specify what is not permitted, like selling the image um, as it's found in the repository or compiling you know, a bunch of images from their database and creating a similar service. So it's kind of a non-complete clause. And then we also have images in the public domain. So where copyright may have expired or the work may have been published within the public domain. And providing source information on some of or an attribution for these resources can be very useful. So in this case, um, I have an image from the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands where images of most, but not all of their artwork are available to download for free from their website and their nice big high resolution uh, files. But say you were including a piece of the artwork, for example, in a presentation or sharing it, it's often really good to give an attribution to, you know, uh, say who the author or creator of the work was, maybe what the work's name is. So it's still really useful to have an attribution so people can track back and know exactly like what work you're including. When we're looking at uh, public domain databases or of like images, sometimes things like the Library of Congress, uh, the British Museum, uh, Bregs Museum, New York Public <laughs> Library Digital Collections. We're thinking about places like museums and archives um, and like libraries where digitizations are held. So these are often um, older images that where copyright has expired. Next, I'm going to talk about finding original sources with reverse image searching. So it's always a good idea to make sure that the image you found online is the original source, um, the original image source, especially if it wasn't found through like a known uh, image database like Unsplash or Wikimedia Commons or something like that. So what I often do is I kind of question from the get go if the image I found 
is reusable. So I always try to find the original source. So I want to see where the image may have been used online in other places. And if um, the place I found it is the original source that it was posted to. So to do that, I often do a reverse image search, and then I can check the terms and conditions of the original source so that I know I'm using an image appropriately. How does reverse image searching work? Well, there's a couple of different options for reverse image searching, and the two that I generally use are Google Image Search or TinEye, which is a reverse image search database as well, or search engine rather. And both of these search engines locate other places online where the same image is located um, or try to find very similar versions of the image and will tell me what those sites are. So different reasons you might want to use reverse image searching um, to locate the original image and the creator so that you can figure out what the terms of use are and if you can reuse the image. Sometimes a reverse image search will also find different versions of the image. So if you want a higher resolution version of the image that you found, you might want to try doing a reverse image search to see if there's a higher resolution version out there. Um, you may want to find if there's a different or altered version of an image. So you might want to find out if different versions of the image exist or, for example, if somebody's taken an image that you own and if they've reused it or changed it, um, doing a reverse image search might bring that up to see who's using it, who's changed it, what changes have occurred, and to find out who's reusing an image. So who else has used it in their work? So this is an example um, that I've had before of finding the original source. And it's an example of a question I've answered recently. So in this case, I was provided with this image. Um, and the question that was asked was that the the person had found this image in an online encyclopedia. And they wanted to know if they could use it for an educational resource that they were creating that was going to be published pu publicly online. So they sent me the link to the image that they'd found as well as the image. And of course, when I clicked on the link to the image, I actually couldn't uh, access it because it was behind a paywall or a subscription. So I wasn't, I didn't have a login to look at it. So. I didn't have any image credit information or an attribution for the image. And I don't know that the encyclopedia was the original source and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on that. So I started reverse image searching. In this case, I used Google image search. And what you can do with Google image search is you can paste an image URL into the search bar, which would be if it, like you right clicked on the image and found like, the link to the image itself. Or what I do more often is I'll save the image. Um, in this case, it was emailed to me. I sent it, to, saved it to my desktop. And then I uploaded the image into Google Images. And then you can see on the right hand side here that Google Images added the word radio to my search. So kind of indicates to me that this is a picture with a radio in it. And I can see some of my results underneath. So some CBC Radio, Radio Canada, and I can see visually similar images below that. And I can see that the image that I searched for is coming up with some hits. And then I see some similar kind of black and white images as well. When I scroll down a little bit more, I get some websites where this image has been reused. Here I can see the Britannica uh, Encyclopedia page where the image is reused. I can see it's in a radio entry, but there's no image credit here. So I kept looking. One of the other sources that was highlighted in my results is the Library of Congress. And when I get to the Library of Congress, I can see that this is kind of a page, um, a photo print or drawing page. So this is kind of an image repository that the Library of Congress has. And I can see that this is a uh, negative of a picture of a radio. It's from 1928. So that's kind of important. And then if I look on the right here, I've kind of scrolled down and just put it on the other side. I can see that I can download different versions of this image that exist. So this is kind of looking like the original source here in that I can download the original image from here. I can also see kind of that the image that I was sent before was a cropped version of this image because I can see kind of the edges around the negative in this case. 
there's a reproduction number, and there's a rights advisory. So that rights advisory is the part that would tell me if the reuse was allowed. Here it basically says that no known restrictions are on this publication. And so that basically means that I should be free to reuse it because there aren't any known restrictions. Also looking at that date, 1928, it's probably out of copyright. So I know I'm free to reuse this image. And if I was to credit it and provide an attribution, which would be a good idea, I would provide a link to this source because this would be the original source of the image. Here's another um, reverse image search I did. I've got two side-by-side -side searches and results here. And in this case, I looked up two openly licensed images from Unsplash that I've seen reused in different places just over the years. And they're images that I've reused as well in presentations that I've given um, different things. So the one is of kind of like someone kind of studying with notes and a computer and a phone. And the one on the right is kind of an interview or a consultation kind of image. And they're in an openly licensed database of images. So a lot of people have probably reused them because the reuse is allowed under the terms and conditions. So here I can see there's a lot of results for both of these images. Um, the one has over 6,000 results and the other one has over 2,000 results. I can also see underneath the image at the very top, that there are different versions available because in Unsplash, there are different resolution versions that you can download. And in the visually similar images, I can see the same image or visually similar images. What's funny on the right hand side is I can even see a cropped version of the image where um, the woman in the light blue shirt has been highlighted or cropped. So that's showing me that those images have been reused quite a lot. Um, it wouldn't be like an absolutely like final number on how many times they've been reused, but it gives me a good estimate. And it also lets me see um, where the image is from. If I'm kind of clicking on different things, I'll see different attribution probably popping up and letting me know where that was found. So image searching for to find objects. And this is what I do um, a lot as well when I'm curious about where an object is from. So this is kind of going beyond um, looking for images for other people and determining the rights, rights usages. So myself, I often use Google Lens, which is an app on my phone to figure out what an image is if I'm just out and about or looking at something and I'm curious about what it is. So Google Lens works a little bit differently than Google Image Search or Tinai. I can um, have the app on my phone and open it up and point my camera at something, at an object and search for it right away. Or I can upload an image like I did in uh, Tinai or Google Image Search. So in Google Lens, I put the same photo of the radio um, into my search and it produces a very similar result. Though in this case, I can see uh, my first visual match is the image that I was looking for. And I can see that there are four results. And I can see that the second of the four results is my Library of Congress um, website that I found to be the original uh, source. I can also kind of focus in on specific objects within the image in, in uh, Google Lens. And what Google Lens is doing that's different than Google Image Search or Tinai is it's finding similar images or very similar images, but it's also finding images that are kind of the same or parts of the image that are kind of the same online. So I can crop in on a specific part of the image. In this case, I cropped in on a tomato. And you can see how the images of the tomato don't look exactly the same, like the outside or background of the picture isn't um, in any way the same as my picture where there's a child. Um, I'm really just finding a bunch of different tomatoes. So it's highlighting that Google Lens believes this to be a beefsteak tomato and it's giving me kind of that information as well. So different result from my previous one where it was giving me my visually similar images. In this case, it's really like, um, tracked in on that image and told me you're looking to figure out what this tomato is. So I've got a couple images from around my house that I also use Google Lens on um, to figure out what they were. 
So in this case, I have a picture on the left-hand side of a vase that I picked up. And you can see I uploaded it in Google Lens and I cropped in on the vase itself. My visual matches are below. And I can see that the first one is pretty much the exact same um, vase with the same coloring. But I can also see that it's picked up a couple different results as well with different coloring, but the same shape. It appears to be the same face as well. Um, from that first result with the image that's really similar, it's a Strella ceramic vase that's made in Germany. It's is what Google Lens is basically retrieving for me in the results. And if I look at the bottom of the vase that I have, that's um, the, um, the stamp that's on the bottom of that as well. So it's able to be verified. So it's reasonably accurate, um, doesn't work perfectly all the time, but you know, sometimes it's just really interesting to figure out what something might be and to get more information about it. So here's another one. Um, this is a lamp that I have. And in the results, you can see how it's bringing up uh, very similar looking lamps, but also kind of similar looking lamps. So I've got like the two at the top that look very similar to this lamp and the three below that that are that are kind of similar in the type of design, but different colors and kind of like proportions. So I click on the one that looks very similar to it, the one with that kind of more brown lamp shade, I get um, kind of like a sale page for this same lamp. I can see the back of the lamp that has the mark. So on the far right, that's a picture of my lamp. And then we've got the one um, that says view visually similar and it gives me a sold and asking price. So I can see that the stamp or the mark on the lamp is very similar or it's the same, obviously. Um, it's in the same place. And I've also got an idea of possible asking price. So I don't know that that's how much this lamp sold for. It could have been a little bit less than that asking price, but I also have a lot more information about the lamp now. I know what the stamp is. It sh should say Marts. It's hard to tell that just from um, looking at the stamp itself because it's in script, but I know that it's also a table lamp by um, Jane and Gordon Martz for Marshall Studios. So kind of an interesting way to find out more information about something. And I have a lamp or a hanging uh, light in my entryway at home and I wanted to see where it was from and I'd never figured it out. So I tossed it in to Google Lens and it's giving me these results. So I've got some uh, different images and kind of the top one was this Ikea lamp. So I'm pretty sure that's um, the match for it, but I can also see some visually similar examples. So there's a lot of places that will have kind of an image search in um, their products. So different places you can do image searches, different websites will have an image search option. So for example, um, one is Pinterest, you can do a visual search of a pin to kind of locate similar objects or the same object. Um, there are a lot of plant identification apps out there to kind of identify what a plant might be kind of for gardeners and whatnot. And there are image searches in other search engines, in addition to like can I or Google image search. Um, I know on my phone, if I'm using the Amazon app, there's a little uh, camera icon on the search bar. So there is some kind of image search I can do. And as you kind of know about image searching and use it, you'll kind of notice these things popping up and kind of like, you'll know what they're about um, in different apps or in different tools. So in Pinterest, I can find visually similar images by zooming in on a specific part of a pin that I have in my board. So in this case, I have an image of a bedroom and there's a light fixture at the top that I really liked and I wanted to find out more about it, maybe uh, where I could buy it or maybe uh, different versions of it. So by cropping in on it and doing a search, I can find different places in Pinterest where this image has occurred. And I can also find out what the original item was if I wanted to purchase it or even a different version of the image that's maybe available for purchase at a lower price point. And this is an example of the different plant identification apps that are out there in the Google Play Store. So you can see that this is quite popular and there's quite a few um, plant apps that are out there. So very popular way to use image searching. And that's 
kind of my presentation. Um, now I'm kind of curious what you would use image searching for, um, or if you've ever done image searching before. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. You, I think, have inspired me to go take random pictures of things in my own house to see where they might have come from before they ended up here. Um, I would like to open this up to questions. Oh, there's one in the chat. Nope, that's just a survey. I can ask you that later. So yeah, I would love to take people's questions if you want to put them in the chat, put up your tiny electronic hand, whatever will work well for you. I have a question. Um, for what would you say for people who might say that copyright doesn't matter or no one's ever going to know that I use this image? Do you have sort of a response or an explanation for them if they if they say that? Well, I mean, copyright's kind of important for any work that you create as well, because whenever any of us creates a work, it's covered by copyright automatically. And you probably wouldn't feel really good if someone reused your work. Um, kind of in the same way, risk with copyright and copyright infringement uh, varies depending on your online profile in some ways. Um, but how are you to know that your profile won't increase in the future or that someone might not send you a cease and desist letter and really kind of, you know, frighten you. So it's, it's important um, because it could come back to haunt you later on or you could regret it. And it's just, it's always good to reuse resources and provide attribution um, because that's what you would want someone to do if they were reusing your work as well. Thank you. All right. In the chat from Alexander, are there some common best practices for using images from a newspaper or magazine in a presentation? Mm. So with images from newspapers or magazines, you can look kind of at the license section of the magazine or newspaper to see what the terms of reuse for the work is. Often with magazines or newspapers, the terms of use of the works will be quite restricted. Um, so really the options are often just to link to that resource. And you'll find that sometimes there are articles that are published and given a Creative Commons uh, license. And in that case, that article or um, newspaper article or magazine article may be available for reuse, but often the uh, image that's attached to that article will have a different license than um, the article in that newspaper or magazine. Um, and often those images are actually more restrictive sometimes because they'll come from different places. Sometimes they'll be reused um, with permission. So you would also have to obtain that permission. Sometimes they'll be Creative Commons images. It really, it really depends what license um, that image has, but often the reuse may not be in line with the content of the article itself. And a lot of uh, newspapers and magazines have pretty uh, tight rights on reuse or republication of their work. So that's when you're looking for that like terms of use section on the newspaper or magazine's website, maybe a copyright section, maybe something about a license. It's usually at the bottom. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thanks Chelsea for the very uh, educational program uh, talk. So much to learn. Um, do you often get uh, faculty members coming to you like with their students work? And are you like, do you, how, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about your role at, at the university and working within the, um, in the faculty. Uh, how does, like, do you help um, faculty with uh, looking for copyright issues or is there like, I'm just not sure if you could just no, maybe. No, it's a good question. Thanks. Um, 
I provide more of an educational role. I often mm -hmm. assist faculty in finding images that they can reuse if they're creating like open educational resources or in their courses. Um, and I'll help students locate images to reuse in their assignments as well. But I'm not um, a, a, enforcing anything. It's more a role educationally to help them locate and reuse things appropriately. Mm, good, thank you. I am curious how intellectual property copyright policies work when it comes to images on social media where the ownership is less clear, right? Like the terms mm -hmm. of use that we all just scroll through and don't read. Um, a lot of social media terms of use indicate that once we upload our own images mm -hmm. to these services, they don't belong to us anymore. So how does reusing that work when when we don't know who the images belong to in that sense? Yeah, that's true, right? Like you can post things, especially on Facebook, and you're agreeing to the terms of use of that page. And I think it's about um, maybe reading or finding out how what that means for your image and what could happen to that image otherwise. And terms of use can be really like weighty and very difficult to read, especially when it comes to things like social media. Um, I don't have a clear answer for that one, uh, but yeah, it can be kind of contentious, um, even with the production of memes and things like that, that you can see circulating and locating original sources and if that was permittable. Um, and sometimes it's kind of like considered a mashup, for example, um or like satire or humor criticism which is allowable in fair dealing to a certain extent um as long as it's not taking away like monetary value from the original you could maybe assess and figure out if that kind of use is allowable and but with any kind of reuse it's a case by case situation right so it's 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 very nuanced So would that fair dealing thing um, come back into play? I'm thinking, well, in a situation like Alexander asked about, where, where maybe this is a presentation to colleagues in the classroom. And so would that change the way that they are able to use newspaper magazine images if, mm. if they're presenting to their peers in class? In that case, kind of not really, um, because a specific license has been applied and that license kind of trumps some of those fear dealing, um, that ability to do, use that. In a lot of cases though, um, like newspaper articles and linking to them is an easy option. Uh, your library will have often a license for a lot of those articles. So a way to kind of use it. Um, appropriately is just to use it through that subscription. And of course, it depends on each situation individually in a lot of ways. It's always easiest to reuse um, resources, especially when we're looking at images from the original source when it's known the reuse can, is allowable. So it's a lot harder, for example, if you create a video and include images that you're not sure about and try to change it after the fact, it's, it's a lot harder to track back and uh, remake that work. This is quickly becoming Andrea Pump's librarians for information. Um, how often do, <laughs> I just have lots of questions about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how often do like the rules and regulations around copyright change or get updated? Like what, what's the sort of version of them that we are currently working with now? I think the last big revision was probably in 2012 um, and it updated some things for digital. Um, but generally copyright stays pretty consistent or similar over time. Sometimes it's just um, little parts of the acts where um, new things will develop, especially as uh, things are tried in court. Um, and I think when we're talking about reusing um, 
images, especially in videos or publicly, we're talking about um, reusing and reposting publicly to the wider web as opposed to a personal use that is staying within the bounds of our own, you know, personal use, which when we talk about things online, personal use is often publicly published, which goes beyond the bounds of personal use. Okay, you said 2012, right? Yeah, I think that was the last like, um, like major overhaul. But I mean, different cases um, occur and then different revisions will happen. But um, it's not terribly often that legislation gets updated or acts get updated. So from the perspective then of like these sort of knowledge keepers that have to deal with this and explain it to the rest of us, um, I just, I imagine it would become increasingly frustrating because this, I mean, 10 years, especially when we're talking about sort of the circulation of changed, digital right? media is. Mm -hmm. A lot is, of things stay pretty uh, consistent. It, it seems more complicated or than it actually is when you start dealing with it more regularly. Um, for example, one change that's coming up in the near future has to do with when things come out of copyright, right? So in Canada, it used to be 50 years after the creator's death. But with some of the new um, kind of like NAFTA agreement stuff, it's going to be 70 years after the creator's death um, coming into effect next year. So I've kind of just like adopted that into when I talk about it now, I just say 70 years after the creator's death. But that's for example, um, something that would change. Does it have a big effect on people though? At the end of the day, yes and no, um, because unless you're worried about reusing resources that are out of copyright, which are a bit older anyway, like it might not really impact you at all. So, so which of the, what part of the government makes these choices? And how do they go about determining what decisions to make or what way to go? Like, do they have hearings where people- They have can... public consultations. Um, they consult with different groups. I don't know, I'm not involved in it, but they, I do hear from listservs every once in a while that they're seeking consultation and they'll get like lawyers that are interested in copyright that will speak. Um, and kind of argue different aspects so that's part of it um there's a whole there's a whole group of people and there's some lawyers that are interested in kind of like educational aspects and you'll get different um groups and associations as well so it's kind of yep um are there are there any circumstances in which i can use, I can reuse an image without knowing its sort of copyright or licensing or attribution requirements? I guess so. Um, but you, you probably want to figure out what they are, what the image is. So you kind of just want to make sure you do your due diligence to make sure that the image you're reusing is allowed to be reused, that the terms allow for that. But of course, people slip up um, and you can always probably change something after the fact if you needed to. But I think knowing how to do a reverse image search to kind of figure out where else that image is posted um, can help kind of lead you to the original source as well. And I mean, the more you kind of know about it, um, the easier it is to kind of figure out how you can uh, figure out the terms of use and find things that are reusable more easily. All right, we've got one in the chat. Uh, there may be a clear answer to this, but how would you know if an image's copyright is outdated? And if outdated, are all the requirements, restrictions automatically irrelevant to the outdated copyrighted image? So in this case, you would say that copyright has expired and that would be 70 years after the creator's death. So 70 years after the creator's death, the image would be in the public domain unless another group has been uh, 
the unless the image has been licensed to another group who still retains those rights, but in most cases it's 70 years after the creator's death. You mentioned that Canada is just in the process of changing it from 50 to 70 mm -hmm. um, to be more sort of cognizant of other international sort of numbers. Um, I'm just nosy for trivia reasons. Um, do you know what the lowest and the highest are in terms of like the I lowest don't. number of years and the highest number of years? No, but I mean, right now, if you were reusing an image, you could go with 50 years after the creator's death until the 70 years takes effect. All right. Um, also from the chat, I can't recall much details, but I once heard years slash nearly a decade ago that once you post or upload something on social media or the internet, it belongs to the public slash consumers. How accurate is, was it when it was said and where do we stand now? Um, I'm just going to hazard a guess because I don't know definitively. And I know that each resource or um, social media platform would have different terms of use or, you know, different um, terms that would apply to an image you upload. For example, um, I don't think it becomes part of the public so much as I strongly suspect that it would have something to do more with that social media platform uh, having some kind of, you know, rights over your image to a certain extent. Um, I don't know what that would be, but that's something just to be cognizant of and just looking at the terms and conditions and making sure that you accept those. Um, something I've heard uh, similarly um, was about Instagram and it wasn't Instagram itself, but people sharing images on Instagram and tagging different companies, for example, where the company may ask them to reuse that image on their platform. And um, if you make some kind of agreement with that company, you're also agreeing to their license to reuse your image, which could be for commercial purposes, be it that they're reposting it to their page, or maybe they're saying that commercially they could reuse your image um, for a marketing campaign, a larger marketing campaign. Of course, it things like that would differ on different companies and whatever license you may be agreeing to. Um, but kind of these things exist, um, within different groups and um, whenever somebody's asking you if they can reuse your image you want to make sure you're looking at maybe like what kind of contract that company may be um, offering you or what you might be accepting so kind of looking into the details especially when it comes to sharing images or allowing someone else to reuse it is a good idea so you know what you're getting into How similar or different are the rules for using and reusing images versus other kinds of intellectual property? They're pretty similar. Um, so images are just one type of work, but if we're talking about like republishing an article or something like that, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, of course, when you're writing an assignment and you're putting like a short quote into your work, that's different um, because you're not republishing a large amount of the original work. But I mean, copyright, just we're talking about application with images tonight. Um, it applies to other types of work as well. We have learned what not to do and how to do things properly to not get in trouble. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And even more so, I would like to thank Chelsea for all of this fantastic information that I now have very detailed notes on. And, and this is great. Um, please check out the Beyond the Wall schedule for the next month and a bit. And I look forward to seeing folks at our next installment in a few weeks.